Namaste, everyone. I'm so honored to be with some great experts of water management who know a lot more than I do. But I firmly believe that uh, climate change is all about water. Hi, um, I'm Ridula Ramesh. I'm a writer on climate change and water. And um, I invest in climate tech startups and agri tech startups. Uh, I'm Srinivasan. I've been uh, at the Indian Institute of Science for the last 40 years, and my main interest has been the study of monsoons and its variation. I'm Marcus Mensch. Uh, I've worked on water and climate, particularly in South Asia, for uh, uh, since the early 90s. Once upon a time, we thought of water as something that each of us was responsible for and something to be managed and something precious. And today, water has gone to becoming invisible, uh, valueless to some extent, um, and something for the government to provide, not for communities to manage. And I think if you take every crisis, and you know, climate change is sort of... Um, you know, everyone who speaks on climate um, uh, uh, speaks of carbon, and they should. It's very important to get our carbon emissions down. But the climate itself speaks through water. Take floods, yeah. take sea level rise, take, um, you know, the melting glaciers, take drought. It's all water. And um, uh, what climate does is actually accentuate contrast. To me, the headlines are often about floods, they're often about droughts, but the subtleties which we don't get to are often things like changes in humidity, where water plays a com incredibly important role and people feel it as heat. Or um, the water transfers that happen between regions, the changes in the ways crops uh, use water and their evaporation, the evapotranspiration, and ourselves as humans, um, our ability to cool ourselves, our sweat, that's all part of this water as a language. And it gets a little beyond the headlines. And I think that exploring into some of those things that are subtle, that are beyond the headlines, is one of the real key things I hope to hear as we explore into this. Now, one thing concerns me, many people who talk about water issues in India uh, think that climate change is the factor which will cause uh, maximum problem for water. I think that's totally wrong. India had a water problem even before climate change began to make its impact because our population has got more than four times in the last 75 years and our use of water has been irresponsible. It so happens today in an editorial in Current Science that I published I point out that there is an existential threat to human beings in the tropics uh, uh, and to all mammals if the temperature goes above two to three degrees. Because there will be periods when both the heat and humidity will reach a level for, this, for which there is no method to adapt. And that's an issue has received very little attention. This issue was highlighted more than 10 years ago uh, in a paper in uh, National Academy of Sciences of USA, but somehow it didn't get enough uh, coverage. And I think uh, that's because the people most affected as Padre Mridala will be in the tropics. A large number of people work outdoors in agriculture and uh, in uh, construction. And for them, uh, it's going to be a a life and death issue. There are parts of India, say in Rajasthan, that get 165 millimeters of rain a year, right? There are parts of India that get five meters of rainfall in three months, right? And you can't do one size fit all. But that's just what we've done because earlier, what we used to eat varied very uh, much between states and what we ate uh, varied very much over time. Today, everybody mostly eats rice and wheat, right? And that's a problem. That's number one. Again, the seasonal difference, right? Um, um, 
uh, you know i live in tamil nadu and our biggest festival is pongal it's not deepavali and it's pongal because our waters we are dependent on river water for cultivation and our waters come in in august we just had our sowing festival and the harvest come in in january which is when we have our harvest festival which is pongal same way in punjab the biggest festival is baisakhi where you know the uh, the sowing happened through the flooding of rivers historically and then the harvest happened in march in central india again the sowing happens when the you know the indian summer monsoon uh, comes on in about june july and the harvest happen in um uh, august september the big festivals happen in october now we've just uniformed it right we've just said okay all the seasonal variability doesn't matter the geographic variability doesn't matter we'll all plant at the same time we'll all celebrate eat the same thing and that just doesn't work and what climate change has done is it's accentuated the seasonal contrast and it's accentuated the geographical contrast and it's made it shown up a bad decision in poor life and now you take the interpersonal differences in water availability the main groundwater development of india started heavily with the green revolution in the 60s and 70s and there was a tremendous expansion in pumping technology that led to very differentiated access to water so if we focus that forward um you know we've had this huge development and it's hugely exacerbated at inequalities we've got this tremendous stress on the system where do you see it going populations don't move where they see the light it's not the vision it's they move when they feel the heat it's the pressure you know there's many elements to this and we when we were writing on this so a decade ago we would frame it as a thousand one percent solutions there's no grand single magic bullet but it's a it's the aggregation of many pieces what works in chennai will not work in uttar pradesh what works in sikkim will not work in gujarat so you need data and you need measurement and i think uh, data first and then you uh, let the data guide you uh, to move forward I, i'll give an example um, in our factory we put 100 meters we're not a big user of water by the way but we've still put 100 meters and what that allows allowed us to do is it, it has allowed us to save millions of liters of water a year on a very tiny spend and you know that's the wow. example that i've seen time and time again across india you know communities wow. adopting a tank yeah. and um, helping manage uh, the water levels of the tank communities um, getting together in rajasthan to rejuvenate you know a system of tanks which has brought 12 rivers to life you know it's i think it's a decentralized solution driven by water but very localized uh, with a lot of hand holding indians generally Uh, do not take water conservation seriously but they respond to a crisis indians do well when there's a crisis the governments act when there's a crisis and it's happened many times so crisis is very important to alert people to the problem they face otherwise they take monsoon for granted for example uh, monsoon does fail once every few years but it has not happened so often in the last 10 years so people may get a little uh, Careless. For example, we know that between the state of Karnataka where I live and Tamil Nadu where Mr. Lee, there are frequent political uh, <coughs> fights over water. But it won't happen this year because this year the rainfall in Karnataka was almost double the normal. Okay, so this year people forget about water. But there will come a year when rainfall will be below normal both in Karnataka and in Tamil Nadu, and there will be true crisis situation. and we have to use those crisis situation to come up with solutions to these problems you you need to have a strong dialogue uh, with the people who are in the front line in this case the farmers but of course there are other groups as well because if you do science systems we save water and save energy but which are favorable to the yields and and the income of the farmers and much less likely to be be used I mean, look i mean how 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 bad it can be done is what when Sri Lanka just last year introduced organic farming. In just one day, they just stopped all fertilizer. No dialogue with the farmers. No long-term plan. No training programs for how the farmers learn to use the new uh, te- techniques. 
and contrast that to a great example, which is in Andhra Pradesh, where one, one million farmers, six million people, are now moved into or, 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 uh, organic farming, but through a long-lasting process of consultation, seeing it work in practice, seeing that you make a better yield than your, your neighbor, and then the neighbor will come and, uh, and try to, to, to learn from it. So that dialogue is absolutely essential. One good international example is from Iran, uh, the Lake Urmia, which is one of the major lakes of so, uh, Iran, was down to 10% of the surface uh, water. Now it's back to 50. Uh, and one main reason is that they have been much better making targeted systems for, for, for water. Not flooding the entire field, but targeting the waters to the plants. Uh, and then saving a lot of water while at the same time uh, improving the life uh, of, of the farmers. Bore well, I think typifies what a powerful technology can do, right? Uh, it's a technology, but the incentives of the users is what matters. Um, for me, my mind on solar water pumps, uh, the jury is still out and the data is still out because um, what the only time it incentivizes farmers to manage their water is if they earn more by selling the water they would have saved uh, back to the electricity board. Uh, that brings in the very real question of the financial health of the electricity boards, which is pretty bad. So, um, solar pumps in drier regions have a mixed record of saving water. The Unfortunately, and I'm being a cynical pragmatist here, I think um, at some point we're only going to optimize water when we run out of it. I think the main issue is that, that India now has a much stronger state than it has been in the past. Both the federal and the local states are much, much stronger in India now, and nearly all of them are dedicated to the environment in a completely new sense. I'm just back from the state of Madhya Pradesh, where the chief minister from BGP, Mr. Shovan, very dedicated to make uh, Madhya Pradesh a green state, a tiger state. They have some uh, wetlands in, in Madhya Pradesh which are, are, are fantastic and they want to make uh, more of them. Move on to Telangana, which is with the opposition. In Telangana, they have increased the, the tree plant, the tree cover with 3% in the last two years. And Hyderabad is a, a tree city in the world because when the state and the government puts itself behind this greening of the state and mobilize people, you can uh, you can get a lot done. We're talking about community action. You're also saying that, you know, really backing that up or, or having a strong state that's engaged in that is an essential complement to that. And it's really this mix of a high level as well as as that that very locally tuned uh, approach that will will ultimately allow many solutions to emerge. I recall a meeting a few years back in Washington with uh, President Obama and he said that when he was a young person, uh, the big issue in the world was not climate change, it was the hole in the ozone layer. No one is talking about it any longer simply because we have resolved it and the ozone layer will come back. But the key is, how was it resolved? Three factors worked at the same time. As you say, community action, people demanded change. Secondly, brave political leadership leading people into the change. And thirdly, business creating scalable technology, which can only come from business. But when people, governments and business work in the same direction, uh, the power is enormous. Solution to the uh, ozone problem is only because it was identified as a crisis. The word whole was a very clever usage of the term. The whole was in Antarctica, not over America. But still, that word was creatively used to identify a crisis. And then we were a little lucky. We had a president who was not standing for re-election, okay? Who happened to be anti environmentalist but who had skin cancer, so he connected with the ozone hole. So to me, that was a lucky part we had. Because if America had not shown that leadership at that time, we would not have solved the ozone problem. So today we need leadership from China and America, because the two leading uh, CO2 emitters, to make a change. And the technology is available. Uh, in the case of ozone, technology was developed rapidly, but here technology is there right now, both wind and solar. There's a study done on snails 
in a snail shells in a particular dried up lake in Haryana. And this looked at how the Indus Valley uh, uh, behaved. And Indus Valley uh, farmers, their cities, masters at water management. You are name it, they had it. You know, the evidence from the snail shells showed that monsoons failed for 200 years, which is what caused, which is supposed to be one of the lines of evidence on the de-urbanization of the Indus Valley. And the Indus Valley at its height was bigger than the Mesopotamian and Egyptian civilizations together. It was mighty. And they they they, they de-urbanized, right? And I think if we go this far, if the accentuation of the water cycle, the, you know, the supercharging of the water cycle and um, uh, you know, the contrast of seasonalities just increases to a point. It, it shows you, you know, the past shows you sometimes how the future might behave. Um, so I think we have to keep that in the back of our thing. We're going in the right path, but I think we need to accelerate. Yeah, well, w what makes me optimistic is going to Tamil Nadu because uh, Tamil Nadu is now six times richer than the poorest states of India per capita. It's an enormous difference. But of course, it shows how fast India can develop. Tamil Nadu is now on level with the, with the poorest states of Europe and one of the big, one of the greatest developing economies anywhere in the world. So it shows the way for India. And the beauty is that for the first time in human history, there is a win-win model for the future. In the past, India wanted to develop. Uh, it had to destroy a lot of nature. It could only develop on the basis of coal and, and fossil fuels, which destroyed nature. There was no other way. Now, all the wind-wind policies are there, going solar and wind, creating more jobs, better health and better environment at the same time. Ecotourism, green agriculture, tree planting, uh, re re renewable energies, electric mobility, all these are win-win propositions for India. So the old debate, do we want to develop in India or do we want to take care of Mother Earth? Can now resoundingly be answered, yes, thank you, we want to do both. And I used to joke about some of these startup things as being you know, putting rubber stoppers on the deck chairs of the Titanic. It wasn't making any difference. <laughs> um, but then we uh, but then we started seeing them aggregate and seeing the numbers. And that's, you know, when you think, oh, I'll be lucky if I see a startup a month and you get six in a day, then you begin to go or six in a week or whatever. You begin to go. There's a lot of people thinking and working on this and seeing little angles in that could really make a big difference. And I think that's that that's my message of hope. You know, I I look at the tremendous impacts that are happening here. I'm I'm sitting at nearly three thousand meters in the mountains where I live. I don't need air conditioning, but I do see the tremendous heat waves across the states, the tremendous water issues. But I also see tremendous innovation emerging. <laughs>